Hi everyone, we're back with the English colonization of North America. We talked about the Spanish, we talked a little bit about the French coming in and laying claim to Louisiana. Now we need to talk about English settlement in the New World. I want you to keep in mind a couple of things from the very get-go when we talk about English settlement in the New World. First and foremost, I want to remind you that the earliest English settlements in, in North America were financed privately by joint stock companies. We talked about that's a, uh, a group of investors deciding to invest in this company uh, with the hope that on the other end they'd make money and would receive a portion, uh, a share of the profits based upon what they had kicked in initially. All right, so understand that, and, and the reason why I mentioned the joint stock companies is for those these first few English settlements is, is they're going to operate with a degree of independence that many other royal colonies won't. When the French come over, when the Spanish come over, those are directly under the governance of the crown, either of France or Spain, meaning the monarchy there is kind of calling all the shots. These earliest English settlements, however, because it is private corporations uh, that are really su supplying the money and kind of directing things from the get-go, the colonists there will have a little bit more freedom to act on their own. They don't have to wait two months for a ship to cross the Atlantic Ocean to tell them yes or no on whether or not they can make decisions. They, they have a little bit more freedom to act in, uh, in the way they see fit. Another difference with the first English settlers in North America is in England by this point in time there already was an expectation, especially among the middle class there, that, that the people have some say in their government. Uh, it's not a democracy, far from it, but it is a system whereby the English expect to be able to have a, a say in their governance. That is not the case. That is not really developed to the same point that it has in England in places like France and Spain. So a couple very important differences for the first English settlers, and I mentioned this last point in particular because while we are now a long way off from the American Revolution, where you end up with the English colonists ready to fight, to rebel against their king and parliament, uh, just understand that doesn't happen overnight. So these earliest settlers are coming over here. They like kind of being left alone to their own devices. They enjoy having a say in their own governance. So later on, when we start to see the government of England, the king and parliament in particular, trying to kind of crack down on these early colonists and say and remind them, hey, we're actually boss, this is going to start to cause some static over time. So England uh, stumbled in their first few attempts at settling the New World successfully, just like France did uh, along the East Coast. The first failure from the standpoint of England was the Roanoke Colony, which was initially established just off the coast of present-day North Carolina and Virginia on one of the islands off of there, initially established in 1584. Um, the colonists who were among that first wave were not resupplied very well. Uh, they're in a strange environment in which they, they don't know the vegetation. They don't know what they can eat that might kill them or keep them alive. They don't know what animals to look for. Uh, and throw in some hostile Native American tribes who may not know who the English are, but you can bet they've heard of these strange pale foreigners from the east and what had happened to their brethren farther south, uh, those who had been enslaved and ultimately died from disease. So the Roanoke colony is going to flounder. Uh, actually, the first wave of settlers there gets up and leaves. They, they take their ship back when they weren't supplied and they started dying off in large numbers. We have a second wave coming in in 1587. Once more, life was very hard. The resupply ship for the second wave of settlers at Roanoke got delayed because of war between England and Spain. Didn't come back for three years. By the time it returned, it was gone. And I mean vanished. That's why Roanoke is often referred to as the lost colony. I mean nothing, no sign of settlement. The only thing, if you'll notice the picture, the artist's representation here, they found a tree with the word Croatone inscribed on it. And no one at that time, no one today even knows what that word means. If it was the name of a hostile Native American tribe that took them over, or the name of a friendly Native American tribe that, that kind of absorbed whatever surviving members of this colony uh, were, were within themselves. Still remains a mystery even to the present day. England's second attempt at colonization fared a little bit better. Jamestown will be the first permanent English settlement. 
but even it's not going to be very pretty. Uh, what we end up seeing in, is in May of 1607, three English ships loaded with a little more than a hundred settlers reached Chesapeake Bay after a stormy four months at sea. They settled a little bit inland along the James River. They're naming it after their King James. Uh, they're settling inland about 40 miles along the James River because they're worried about the Spanish. They know the Spanish are patrolling these coasts, uh, worried about anyone that might try and, and uh, uh, you know, invade what they consider to be their territory. So they settle inland. They could not have chosen a worse spot for settlement. They choose a, a, a mosquito-filled swamp the, that where there's pools of standing water that breed mosquitoes that spread yellow fever, malaria, terrible location. Not only that, but the river, even though it's the, about 40 miles inland, still backwashes with ocean water at high tide, making the water very salty and just not very healthy. So they chose really a terrible site to, to kind of set up camp. Worse was the fact that there was no leadership in early Jamestown. Incredible as it might sound to our ears, among the first settlers at Jamestown were middle class to upper class businessmen. They did not bring people there who had actual survival skills, like those that were carpenters or knew how to fish or how to craft weapons. Instead, it was a bunch of well-to-do investors, businessmen, who thought, oh, this will be fine. This will be a lark, right? I'll, I'll go across to uh, help set up this new colony. I'll come back having made some money with some uh, awesome tales of adventure. These were individuals that had servants cooking for them at home, that had servants, you know, taking care of growing crops or what have you. So you end up with a colony that is, is squabbling, fighting amongst themselves. That is until the Virginia Company of London that is financing this, uh, this settlement at Jamestown. They decide to send over John Smith, a seasoned soldier in the English Army. When he comes over, he really helps to kind of get some discipline on the ground. Don't tell me that you're too good to go over there and try to catch fish. Don't tell me that it's beneath you to cook food. Everyone has to contribute if we are going to survive. you got to love his motto, too. He that will not work shall not eat. Unfortunately for the colony, John Smith suffered uh, a terrible gunpowder wound and ended up having to sail back to England the following year. And so the winter of 1609, 1610 was terrible. It was known as the starving time when uh, of, of the 900 or more settlers that were sent to Jamestown the following spring in 1610 of those more than 900 settlers only 60 had survived. According to one colonist Talking about that horrible winter, he said, quote, Famine compelled us wholly to devour those hogs, dogs, and horses that were then in the colony, together with rats, mice, and snakes. One man had reportedly dined on his wife, and just recently, within the past couple of years, excavations at the Jamestown site by archaeologists have revealed the remains of a young girl, uh, probably a teenage girl, who had, um, uh, who had knife marks on her bones. The only way you end up with knife marks on your bones is if someone is chopping the flesh off of you, presumably to consume. So we do have ample evidence of cannibalism at the Jamestown colony. As you can see, this is a primary source that I've given you here on the screen uh, from George Percy. These guys are dying off like flies. They're dying of swellings, uh, the bloody flux, probably diarrhea, wounds, he said, given by what they called the savages, meaning the Native Americans. Uh, they're starving to death, a small can of barley in water. He talks about how slimy and filthy the water was, so that, that's not helping things. And actually, the saving grace for the Jamestown colony is the Native Americans, the very people that they still characterized as savages, as beneath them are the ones taking pity on these people and actually offering them corn, giving them something to eat to keep them alive. So you might wonder, well, if things were that rough, why didn't the, you know, the Virginia Company of London just cut their losses, just say, screw it, you know, this is just not worth it? Because they had invested so much money already. They'd invested time, they'd invested money, they'd invested people's lives. They had to find a source of wealth. And as you, as they figured out, just like the Spanish had, there's no gold nuggets laying around on the ground for you to pick up. There's no pearls, there's no rubies and emeralds. They had to find a way to make this new colony economic 
economically viable. They did this by discovering uh, a milder form of tobacco. Tobacco being a New World crop that was grown by native peoples and used for ceremonial purposes. Uh, once a milder variety of tobacco seed was introduced to the Jamestown colony, now and, and a taste for it was developed back home in Europe. As demand for tobacco uh, increased in Europe, now it makes sense. Uh, people start flocking to the Jamestown colony. They need plots of land uh, to grow this cash crop, as it becomes known, because they're selling it just to sell it off. That's, or they're growing it just to sell it off. This is the economic saving grace of the Jamestown colony. Now, looking much further north, we need to talk for a few minutes about a couple of waves of Puritan settlement in New England. The Puritans were a Protestant sect, Protestant denomination that had peeled off from the Church of England. And for that reason, they were not very well liked back home in England. Uh, the Puritans called themselves the Puritans because they believed that they were purifying the Church of England. They were stripping it of all its ceremony and, and um, you know, uh, remnants of elitism. So the Puritans will end up um, making their way to the New World. They're, they're Ships are going to get blown off course, actually, in the first trip in 1620. They're going to get blown far north of where they actually intended to settle. They intended to settle north of Jamestown in the Virginia area. They, they ended up north, but far north in what we think of as present-day Massachusetts. And along the way, they have months to think about what type of society they want to establish here in, in what they will call New England. And when they do, they will come up with the so-called Mayflower Compact, named after one of the ships that was carrying them over. This will be the first set of new laws created for the New World. They are starting over. These are not peoples that want to come over here and strike it rich and then go back to England. They're done with England. They're tired of being harassed, killed in some cases, for their faith. They're coming over here to settle permanently in large family units. So they need to create a working body of laws for them and future generations. So the Mayflower Compact will end up being just that document. We'll have another set of Puritans coming over about a decade later and settling just south of the first settlement at the Plymouth. Uh, colony. And here we go again, like with the Plymouth Colony, we have a, a joint stock company underwriting their uh, their uh, voyage, the, the uh, Virginia Company of Plymouth. In this case, in 1630, with the second wave of Puritans coming over, it will be the Massachusetts Bay Company, named after the Massachusetts Indian Tribe. And John Winthrop will be heading the second round of Puritan migration to the New World. He's a lawyer with a number of sons who, uh, he's for religious reasons, he wants to come over and, and provide better for his family. He also knows that the New World has plenty of land for his son to come over and set up their families as heads of household to support themselves. Um, and just like with the Puritan colony uh, that, that was established uh, a decade prior, it's going to be a hard go. It's going to be a lot of death during those first few years as they learn the landscape, as they learn what they can eat, how to grow corn, and, and once more it will be the native peoples that will help school them in, in what they can do uh, uh, in this area of the world to make a successful life. And as I mentioned earlier in this lecture, I want to revisit the point of self-government from as soon as they step off the boat for these English settlers, no matter if they're in Jamestown, no matter if they're in Plymouth, or later on the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they want to call the shots for themselves. So when we think about the Puritan colonies in so-called New England, first Massachusetts and then later uh, New England and, and Connecticut, they're going to have town meetings where if you have to be a member of the Puritan church, here's where they did not practice, uh, they did not practice uh, religious toleration. If you were not a member of the Puritan Church, you could not attend one of these town meetings. But this is what they do. They meet several times a year to make decisions, the tax rate, alliances with native tribes, what have you. That's at the local level. Then at the colonial level, they're also going to establish a legislature, the general court as it becomes known. Two members of each town will send uh, representatives to make decisions on behalf of the entire colony. This will be a slightly different in the South where there will be no 
religious requirement for office. There are plenty of religious people here, but that's not the primary uh, way that you participate. Instead, people are scattered across the landscape. You can see from the map here, uh, it sometimes might be miles between settlements. These people uh, just want to participate in their own government, and they will establish the earliest form of that, the House of Burgesses in the Virginia colony, the first colonial legislature.